Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to our third Food for Thought webinar. Um, I'm just waiting for, we have quite a few people joining up, so um, we'll just give them a minute or two. <clears throat> and I'm just looking down the names of things, and it's fantastic to see lots of new people. as well so that's great so tonight and um, this evening we're delighted to welcome Claire McQuillan and Erin Bunting so Claire and Erin are both terrific foragers um, and have been for for many years um, and they they both cater for um, for the people who are lucky enough to be able to have them up their ends of the country um, and produce lovely stuff from scratch, from foraged ingredients, and also from stuff that they've grown, particularly in, in Erin's case. So, um, so we had the girls had made a brilliant wee video, um, and we were having a few problems trying to share it this evening. So, I think what we're going to do is um, in the chat box. We're going to put up a link. I think Claire's going to put up a link for us. Um, just a wee bit of housekeeping. If, so we will play the video. Um, there's lots of brilliant information in there. If you and then as we go through or and afterwards, if you have any questions, if you could use the Q and A box along the bottom, um, that would be really useful rather than the chat box. It just means all the questions are one place. So don't miss anything. Um, And hopefully we'll be ready to go soon. Do you want to say hi, Erin? Yes, hello. Um, I'm Erin Bunting. Um, I'm, uh, I run a little supper club and catering business called The Edible Flower with my wife, Jo. Um, we're based in Saintfield in County Down. Um, and we do uh, some foraging, though Claire is really the expert forager here. Um, but we do do some foraging for um, menus and supper clubs. Um, and also we have a no dig kitchen garden based, uh, based here as well. So we grow um, a lot of the produce that we use for our catering and supper clubs and workshops and things as well. And then um, can I ask you, Erin, just when, when Claire's getting a wee link up, what, um, when did you start foraging or what got you into it in the first place? Well, I guess I probably like lots of people, I'd always done, well, not, you know, I'd always done a very kind of little bit, like mostly things, you know, as a child, like blackberries and um, kind of wild raspberries, I guess, fruits and things like that. And I guess, you know, picking rose hips and things like that. So just very kind of little bits and pieces. And then I retrained as a chef about five years ago now at Ballymalee Cookery School, um, so down in Cork. Um, and when I was down there, they're really keen for you to know about wild ingredients as well as they have a big organic farm there. So um, you learn a lot about growing or, or certainly kind of in touch with growing when you're kind of cooking. Um, and also they take you out on lots of kind of foraging walks and things like that. So to talk about lots of kind of ingredients that you might be able to use. So then just after that, I got really interested in it. And so um, I just, um, you know, kind of a mixture of kind of self-taught and probably lots from Claire who um, works, we work together quite a lot. So I learned lots from Claire, been on lots of foraging walks and then just bits and pieces. And I guess a lot of my foraging, which I'm sure Claire would say as well, um, probably well, much more than me because she does lots more foraging than me, but um, very much about ingredients for that are tasty and can be used in to make a, a meal really special, I guess. So it's sort of, um, uh, much more on the side of those ingredients that like have something really special to offer rather than kind of survivalist foraging. So, um, you know, things that are, are absolutely beautifully tasty and um, that you can kind of use to kind of transform a dish to something else. So um, kind of definitely more on that side. Um, and also just, I think it's that opportunity to have some of those kind of, um, you know, something special, you know, you can, you know, and it's free and it's something special. And it's also a really nice thing you can go out and do, you know, with, friends or something like that and you get out in the fresh air and like collect some bits and pieces and it's kind of an excuse to go somewhere for a really nice walk. So 
we're waiting for some um, questions to come in from, from the rest of the guys. Um, I have one I got sent earlier. Um, do you need permission to forage? Um, Claire, Claire, please. Yeah, that sounds like one for me. Um, uh, so if you're in a on a public in a public space and by a public space I mean um, like a park or even along a kind of quiet roadside um, places like that you are permitted to forage without requesting permission mm -hmm. um, if you're on private land so and that includes personally owned land or potentially like land owned by Woodland Trust or National Trust it is wise to ask permission first so um, those places, Woodland Trust and National Trust, I work with both of them. I've, I've done work with both of them. They don't discourage foragers, but it's always good to keep yourself right. Um, but from a legal standpoint, if you're on public areas, so from a public park or something like that, it's totally, totally fine. You're welcome to forage at your leisure. That's great. Brilliant. Thank you, Claire. Um... And there's another, I've got another question here. How, how did you, how did you learn to forage, Claire? I suppose we've, we heard from Erin earlier. Yeah, um, so um, uh, I'm mostly self-taught. Um, so I got, I started, um, I guess, getting into foraging really seriously about five years ago um, after I went out with um, a walk with a guy called Phil Simpson, who is a um, bushcraft expert. Um, who works in Belfast and he's an amazing guy and he took a walk up Cave Hill um, uh, and he does a regular one actually he does it he runs it every year and it's amazing it's a really walk I really really recommend he runs it for free as well with um, with um, Cave Hill Conservation Campaign but anyway I went out with him and um, I'd always been interested a bit like Aaron I'd always collected the kind of um, I guess the 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 foragers 101 kind of basic things you know like wild garlic and um, blackberries and um, and uh, crab apples and stuff like that and I was interested in ingredients it's really ingredients I was really um, led by and um, when I went out on this walk um, I, I didn't expect to learn tons but I did he he showed us about 30 different use, usable or edible plants on that walk and um, it was a completely mind-blowing moment for me that day and from there um, I was like, I can't believe all these ingredients are there and they're free and I can just go and take them and I can use them and they're seasonal and they're local and they're quite exotic actually because there are things that you can't buy in the shop. So it was just really amazing. So from there, um, I really just practiced myself. So I got myself some books. Um, I went out in lots of walks and I still go out in lots of walks with other foragers because we all learn incredibly um, from each other all the time. And, um, and just practice. So the, the biggest tip I give for somebody who's starting to learn foraging is get yourself a book for sure, but also just go out. So going out and spending time outside and observing everything around you and picking things up and compa comparing leaf shapes and um, understanding what the season is like, because you know every, every area, even within Northern Ireland, every area is different. So you get to know what the season is like and that's really what I've done for like the last few years and and now I'm lucky enough that I teach it as well so um which I've done for the last two years so yeah and again I'm still always learning so it's a it's a it's a lifetime practice honestly oh that's that's great Claire and um, actually there's a question in there from um Nicola she'd like to know what what books would you recommend yeah certainly um so one book I do suggest um, to start off with is a book called Food for Free um, by Richard Maybe, who, um, and that book's been around since, gosh, I think it's been around since the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, they just keep on bringing it out every year and every year and every year. It never seems to kind of go out of style or out of print at all. And they kind of just update it a little bit every, every year with different images, but actually it's fundamentally stayed the same, that book. And I really like it because... Um, there's lots of very familiar plants in it, so lots of things that people will probably already recognize um, if they're kind of starting off, um, but that you didn't maybe know that they were edible, but also it's got recipes in there. So um, lots of foraging books or lots of, I guess, plant books are kind of very botany led and they can be a wee bit intimidating. This one's lovely because it strikes the balance between here's the plant, here's an image of the plant, here's 
a description, but also here's a nice recipe. And he has lots of things about wines and jams and um, different things that he's done over the years. So it's a it's a really uh, amazing kind of like first first go um, of using. There's lots of other I'm kind of food led, so there's lots of other kind of really good recipe books out there. But definitely, if you're getting started, that's the one I would get. That's great, and we'll um, we'll remind people of of um, it should maybe book whenever we're sending out um, the emails for the next webinar. Um, Nicola had also asked that um, any ideas of what else she could do with slows. She's not really a gin drinker. Um, is there such a thing? I didn't know. So. <laughs> slows. What? Um... Well, I've certainly made slow jelly a few times. Um, so uh, a kind of similar process, you know, if to making any other type of jelly, but you would need to add some crab apples or something in it, I think. So maybe slows has enough but anyway I've always it's hard to collect enough slows to make a lot of jelly so I've always mixed it with some other bits and pieces as well so I've done it as a kind of sort of hedgerow jelly and I've also done it as a slow jelly but with some um I think I put some crab apples in at that time just so that you know you definitely would have enough pectin for setting it um so that's really nice and it gives you a lovely really dark you know the same color as slow gin um a really nice dark jelly um don't know what else what well, you could probably put it in a ketchup Claire do you think I think so yeah like um uh definitely it's it's on my list because slows are like lots of um lots of fruit are having a really good year this year so I've seen loads of slows out um and definitely I think they're worth experimenting with because there's there where I've been there's tons and tons on the on the bushes um so I have done I've done the traditional like the slow gin um I've actually made slow rum um, slow dark rum, which um, is really, really nice if you want to try something different um, using dark rum with that. And it makes it, it kind of gives it this really kind of almost medicinal edge on it. And I think it's really, really awesome. But if you wanted to do something that's kind of um, more fruity, what I've got planned for next week is actually make fruit leather with um, with slows. So like everybody knows the slows have that kind of like bitter, dry flavor. But like once you start adding sugar and kind of adding things to it, um, I'm really hoping I haven't done this now. Uh, no, you know, um, heads up. <laughs> it's not an ex it's not tried and tested uh, recipe, but um, making fruit leathers is a really nice thing to do. And I feel like uh, putting lots of sugar in there will help bring out that kind of more plummy sweetness in it. Um, so that's what I'm going to do because there's so much. So it would be a waste not to try and do something kind of fruity with them. So um, kind of similar to how Erin made the um, the jam so you add you add uh, apples to it so apples give it the pectin and that kind of texture add your slows cook them up and then strain them through um, a, a sieve and you want to get that texture from the apples and from the slows and then put it on a on a bit of um, silicone mat or a parchment and then um, pop it into a low oven to dry so you get left with this kind of like chewy fruity I guess it's kind of like a candy really but yeah so that's what I've got planned to do with it so definitely worth trying to harness that kind of the, the fruitiness in there because I think they've got lots of flavor potential mm. that's, that's brilliant thank you um yeah questions are coming in now um Vicky wants to know how would you use rose hips well that actually uh prompts the next one of the next videos but um in the next in one of the the kind of webinars coming up we're going to actually use them to make a ketchup so um we're mixing them with some crab apples and some hawthorn as well um and using it to make a kind of spicy ketchup with a bit of chili in there so um that's a really good way because there's quite a lot of texture in um uh uh rose hips once you've um uh kind of put them through it, one of the things with rose hips is that they've got these little seeds and hairs inside them which are actually an irritant so you can't eat those so you need to make sure that whatever way you cook them either you can cook them and um or you can take them out the hairs out before you put cook them and then um cook them up or you can cook them up and then you've got to strain them a couple of times you know through a very fine mesh sieve in order to make sure that definitely comes out but they were great for adding the kind of the kind of bulk and the texture that kind of gloopiness to um a ketchup um, and I've also made a few times a rose hip syrup, which is really good and it's super good for you as well, like lots of vitamin C in it, but it goes really well in a cocktail or just in a non-alcoholic cocktail as well with lots of kind of fruit and sparkling water. Um, 
or drizzled over. I've done it drizzled over ice cream as well, the rose hip syrup. Um, probably make a really nice sorbet, actually, rose hips. I have never done that. We've done quite a lot of um, things with uh, sort of wild sorbets, but I haven't done a rose hip sorbet before. But I imagine it makes such a lovely syrup. It would make a really delicious, if you then converted that syrup into a sorbet, it would be really delicious as well. I don't know. I'm sure Claire's got some other ideas on things to do. And also, I always put them in hedgerow jelly. If I'm collecting a whole lot of random things, I tend to collect quite a few random things over the season and just throw them in a bag in the freezer. And then at some point over the winter, um, boil them up to make a, a jelly. Um, so elderberries would go in there as well and some sloes and some rose hips and some blackberries. And then you can kind of have a, a sort of random mix and it's different every year. But Claire's probably got things to say about rose hips, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, Claire, do you want to tell them about the amazing, the amazing rose hip thing that you uh, made? I'm thinking about rose hip sorbet now. Rose hip sorbet sounds amazing. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, like I agree with uh, everything that Erin said there. It's kind of, they're quite versatile. So you can put them into something savory and something sweet. Um, I'll do a shameless plug for myself. I did um, I did a whole kind of series of little recipes on my Instagram using rose hips to try and kind of play up though it's kind of um, amazing flavor because they do taste incredibly good and add quite a lot to a dish. But one thing I thought was quite successful and actually Erin did try this was um, a rose hip meringue pie. So using rose hips in the, in the way you would use lemons. So they kind of colored and flavored the, um, the custard for the pie. And I thought it was quite effective. So yeah, they're, they're, there's lots of uses in them. That's that sounds absolutely amazing. <laughs> I've got to I've got to say about Claire because you you should I, I thought you were going to say about the amazing rose hip. Um, she made like you know those pepper dew peppers. You know where you get those little peppers that have like the salty cheese. So Claire like scraped all the seeds out those the bigger rose hips. So the Rosa Ragosa, which is the kind of uh, the fatter one, and um, then had cooked them down. I, you must have poached them, did you? In like a, a and then filled them with and they were absolutely amazing the flavor was amazing and they looked just like those little pepper dew peppers it was pretty cool That's yeah that was those were those were really good um they're on my list again to make this week so because yeah. they were so delicious so that sounds, that sounds fantastic you're making me hungry again um, and we have a question from rory to say um presume you can make blackberry and apple crumble with crab apples question mark Yes, I don't know. Do you want to say something about that, Claire? I feel like you, uh, we were talking about crab apples and Claire knows the actual variety of crab apples and I'm like not anywhere near that good. <laughs> well, I know I know some uh, varieties and um, I, I'm not like, um, I'm definitely not a gardener and I don't know that much about varieties of, of, of things, to be honest, that are kind of garden varieties. But um, definitely there's some nice varieties of crab apples that are they're described as ornamental, but but you know that means that they're pretty. It doesn't mean that they're not edible. Um, so um, and actually, the case for a lot of people think that um, crab apples um, will give you an upset stomach or something like that, or they're because of their acidity levels and things like that. That's not true. Um, my experience with um, crab apples or kind of um, feral apples, I guess, apple trees that have just grown grown up by accident I guess um, is that you have to taste them to see if they're if they taste good so sometimes they are really really sour um, which makes them really useful for different things so you know good for a sour like a sour apple usually has really amazing apple flavor so that makes it perfect for an apple crumble you know I'm a fan of um, a lot of acidity and tartness in a, crab, a crumble or a, a tart or something like that so adding in really sour crab apples with some sweet blackberries with a little bit of brown sugar and then your kind of sweet kind of maybe oatmeal-y topping I mean that's perfect you want that kind of balance in there so if you if you have access to a lot of crab apples yeah do not um, feel like they're not suitable for a crumble or something like that they're they definitely are um, but taste them first to see you know if they do need a bit more sugar or if they need a bit of help you know in fact I've even added um, apple cider vinegar to some wild apples that I found before because they don't have enough acidity so um, so yeah the only way to know is to try them. That's great thank you Claire and um, we've got two questions now from Avril um, first one is what berries are out now for making jelly and the second one is what do you recommend for straining um, fruit for jelly? Hmm. 
Um, Maybe I'll take the first one yeah, part of that and you can take the second part there, Erin. Um, so what berries are at now? So um, we talked about slows. So slows are having an amazing year. Everything in that kind of family. So that's kind of greater rose prunus family, which is the plum family. Everything from that family is having a really, really fantastic year. So slows are out and will be out for the next few while. So you can definitely include those in your jelly. Um, blackberries, of course. Raspberries, in fact, are still out. So because it's been relatively mild, um, I have found quite a lot of wild raspberries still around. So you'll find those definitely in the city in Belfast. Um, what else? We've got apples for jelly. What other berries are out? I'm trying to think. Maybe Probably hawthorn berries. berries you still oh, yeah, yeah. Hawthorn as well, of course. Yeah, so um, hawthorn berries, um, they don't have a ton of flavor, but they do have something about them, which I think is quite special. There's something between like a, a kind of, like a woodiness that you'd find in blackberries, but also like a little bit of kind of an apple skin flavor in there as well. Um, they're massively undervalued and there's tons and tons of them out there. So they're definitely worth including. That's lovely, thank you. Um, sorry, yes, uh, you were gonna ask the second, answer the second part. I, I, um, I always strain through a kind of a fine muslin. So um, uh, just, uh, you can buy, there's various sites online where you can buy a, a muslin. I'm sure you can buy them in shops as well, but I don't know. I have bought in the past a jelly bag um, online, um, but I tend to find that they, well, the one I bought anyway, it wasn't big enough. So it was just like a bit annoying. Um, so I always find that, so I just find the easiest thing to do is put a, sit in a bowl and then you put your sieve or a colander and then you line it with your muslin and then um, uh, hang it up. And if, if you're really worried the muslin's too thin or something, you know, you can you can double up the muslin um, and then hang it up. I just hang it up off a um, a cupboard door usually in my kitchen and then drip, drip. And I always keep the colander in place so that if it does fall off, hopefully it will the colander will catch it and you won't end up with like um, the juice in, you know, the pulp and then you have to strain again. And the most important thing with straining a jelly, if you want your jelly to be clear, is you have to let it, you don't squeeze it. You know you've got to let it till it just drips out so just don't squeeze it because if you squeeze it you'll end up with cloudiness in your jelly which is fine but it won't look as kind of beautiful and clear okay lovely um we have another one from rory here um have you recommendation for using damsons i'm sure you have millions um yeah like just you can just use them like a, a plum so um uh uh, I've pickled them before, which is really delicious, actually, uh, like a kind of um, because uh, it's quite a common um, to have like sort of sour pickled plums in like um, Japanese cooking and things like that. So I've pickled them before and that's really delicious. Um, but I've also just used them in like cut them up, um, take, uh, take the stone out and use them in crumbles and things like that. If I'm making a preserve with them, I tend to make a jelly because I can't be arsed to fish out all their seeds. <laughs> <laughs> so I know some people make a jam and leave the seeds in, um, which I guess is fine, but I always get a bit stressed out about the fact someone's going to like break their tooth on it. So um, uh, I know some people, you can, I quite often make a plum jam, which obviously is the, a bigger fruit um, or a plum compote as well, actually. But, um, uh, and if you boil it up, the seeds will float to the top and you can skim them off, but it is a bit fiddly. Um, so, Yeah. I've made a damson kind of drizzle before as well and put it through, I've actually done that with blackberries quite often as well, um, put it through an ice cream. So, you know, like uh, rippled it through an ice cream. So made a, a vanilla or, um, uh, well, I've made a vanilla one with damson through it. And then I've made a bay flavored ice cream base with blackberries through it. And that's really nice combination because blackberry and bay goes really well together. So yeah, a, a, an ice cream would be lovely, yeah. Fantastic. Claire, do you probably have some suggestions about things you've done with damsons? Uh, uh, yeah, that sounds amazing. I actually just thought last year, one thing I made with um, quite a lot of wild thum, uh, plums was ketchup. So we're doing ketchup with um, the rose hips, like Aaron mentioned, but you could swap out the rose hips in the recipe for plums instead. And um, they make a really amazing ketchup. It's more actually close to something like HP. Uh, brown sauce than it is uh, ketchup um, and add you know add some spices in there so a bit of clove and a bit of cinnamon and things like that into a, a plum or a damson ketchup um, is really really delicious as well. Yeah. 
That's lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, another one from Nicola, or a couple. Um, Erin, where did you get your huge pot? It looked great. I, it's actually it's a new purchase I've been making jam for like years now and uh I always res resented the idea that I had to buy a separate pot for it but um I actually it is really good I bought it on Amazon um I can't remember what the brand is um but it was like I, I just get, bought it on Amazon it was 40 pounds um and I it has been worth it the advantage of that kind of pan from jam making is um I have lots of big pans because I'm I run a catering company, so I obviously have like big pans, um, but they're all straight sided, so it is good if you're making a lot of preserves. It is good to have a jam pan because it's slightly smaller at the bottom and then goes up at the sides, which means is that with the key with making a jam, which I actually didn't really talk about quite so much in the video. But one of the key things when you're making a jam or preserve is you want to get it up to its setting point temperature as quickly as possible because that preserves a fresh flavor. So you know if you're boiling your jam for like you know 45 minutes or an hour or something like that it'll still be fine but you'll lose some of that kind of like lovely freshness that you get um from you know kind of the beautiful fruit that you've just um you know collected so um the advantage of that type of pan is it's got this nice wide top so you've got more area for evaporating off the water which is obviously what's helping it bring it up to that temperature that's going to allow it to set so so just from amazon um but if you are making a lot of jams, I would recommend it. And also the spout has revolutionized the jam potting up process. Fantastic. And would you just search for um, preserve pan or jam yeah. pan? Or you know what, I will, if in a second here, I'll just have a look and see if I can find it and send the link. I shouldn't really be promoting Amazon, should I? I mean, that's like, I feel like, you know, they're not <laughs> the best company in the world, but they do handily deliver things to uh, you know Northern Ireland without charging you extra money. So I don't know if there's any local suppliers of jam pans anyway. So <laughs> no, I don't know where whether I've not, I haven't seen one in a shop here. You might be able to get one lit in plastic. I guess that's probably another place where you might be able to get one if you wanted to buy it in shop. Um, sure. I think one is there one is there a lit in plastic on the Boucher Road? Yes, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is. Um, just when Erin's looking for that. Um... Oh, that uh... noise, but anyway, um, Nicola has asked. Um... Do you recommend looking out for um at this time of year as for the district and maybe cover not in one of the webinars? Sorry, James, I hear you there. Like a really weird noise. Yeah, same here. Um same here. I don't know where that's coming from. I don't I don't know either. Maybe Claire, is it your Give that laptop a shake. <laughs> um, yes, Nicola had asked, uh, well, I'll ask the other question first, actually. Um, I, she's wondering what kinds of things you grow in the kitchen garden at the minute, and are you currently planting or sowing anything in particular? What time? What type of things we're growing in the garden at the moment? Um, I feel like maybe it's me causing this noise. I feel like every time I hover over, I'm trying to go on to the, I don't know whether it's not or not, but it feels like every time I hover to go and look at the Amazon, it's uh, it's uh, it's doing that. So I'm not going to do it. Um, so uh, at the moment, we're, we're, it's actually still, uh, well, we had we had a couple of frosts here in St. Field, actually. So um, we the season ended a little bit earlier than we expected um, for some things. So um, we've been harvesting like courgettes and tomatoes and cucumbers um those kind of great well the tomatoes and cucumbers in a greenhouse uh, and we're still harvesting tomatoes actually um our tomatoes are still going really strong this year they haven't had blight which has been great um uh but we've been harvesting loads up till now and then it was just the last week really with that frost that things have started to slow down so um courgettes and um all our potatoes are up now um uh lots of um salad leaves so we what during lockdown there we started a little salad growing business so um we've always grown salad for our own events um and for ourselves and then um because 
we lots of things were stopped during lockdown and we didn't really have um the catering jobs that we would normally be doing we started a little salad growing business so we're still growing a lot of salad and lettuce actually um uh we won't grow le much lettuce over the winter um uh because it just grows so slowly but we'll grow um we'll have lettuce that'll go in that is in now and is overwintering um uh so you need to you would need to be getting it in have your plants kind of ready to go win now because everything because of the shortening days now everything is growing much more slowly um so if your lettuces are in now and um they can be um uh you know they'll grow a little bit when you get a couple of good days and you'll be able to get a few leaves off and they'll last right through till till the springtime um and then they'll go to seed uh, once it warms up um but we'll be putting in lots of we're still sowing and we'll be putting in lots of um mustard leaves and kind of oriental greens and things like that so which we'll be using over the winter so all the kind of mizunas and mabunas and red frills and green frills and uh these different kind of mustards and rockets and things and rocket as well so all those things um <laughs> uh, i was just going to say that um becky has said that she'd made rum top this year which is good for leftover wild soft fruit and a traditional Bavarian recipe, so. I've never heard of it, sounds great. I haven't either, but it does sound great, Vicky. So I send us the recipe and we'll share it with other people. Um, and Nicola, so the, another question is, what veg would you recommend, well, greens, I suppose, would you recommend looking out for at this time of year or is it just about the fruit? And I know we'll be covering that in one of the next webinars really uh, uh there's still lots of things i feel like claire i feel like i can't talk because then I'm, I'm like uh, i'll be like claire i'll be like what is she saying um uh, claire should correct me if i'm wrong or maybe claire's going to speak but um i uh lots of things have a second you know lots of things in the summer um of those kind of early spring wild greens um you know in the summer they start kind of going to seed and they're less delicious uh the same as lots of the plants you grow in your garden as well so once kind of lettuce or something starts going to seed it gets much much more bitter and that happens in a similar way with lots of wild plants as well but um quite a lot of wild plants especially if you if they've been cut down uh will have a second uh flush in the autumn time so you get some of those um new nettles coming up um and you can get some nettle tops again or um, dandelions and um, you know they're coming all the time anyway. Uh, there's loads of chickweed in my garden at the moment which we've been throwing into salads as well um, so uh, and uh, the cresses as well some of them will have a kind of I mean I feel like I can just pick cresses look uh, uh, you know land cress and bitter cress and things like that they sort of seem to this time of year there seems to be loads of little plants of them as well but i feel like claire probably has way more to say on that than me so um she's much better on all her uh greens than i am well listen we'll really we'll look forward to the next one and um, i see that um vicky has come back with the rum top to say you bury the fruit in the rum for three months then drink the rum for christmas and make a cake with the fruit so it sounds awesome yeah, that sounds awesome. And she provided she's provided a wee link there as well. Um, and final question is um, who had asked this? Um, um, Napier. What was the bushcraft guy's name? I think it was Phil. Somebody. Um, Phil's name. Claire's name. Oh yeah, Claire's typing it in. Yeah, I'm just going to type that one in. Um, and that seems to be everybody's questions and um, we've run over a little bit, but thank you very much everybody for, for joining us um, this evening. Thank you very much to Erin and Claire. You were both awesome as I knew you would be. Um, I'm very much looking forward to, to the next one as well. Um, and I did you, uh, Phil Simpson. Yeah, so Phil Simpson was the name of the bushcraft guy. So thanks a million. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening and we'll see you the next time. Thanks everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, thanks a million. Thank you.